The Northwest Territories of Canada stretch from the 60th parallel to the Pole. Over the Arctic tundra, snow is spread for eight months each year, over a million square miles, with few people or little growth to give them life. The North, bleak but rich, a constant challenge to man's imagination and hardihood. By canoe and dog team, men have entered the North for 200 years, up to the Arctic coast where Eskimos make an uncertain living from the sea. The Eskimos' life is a long fight against cold and hunger. It is the toughest life on Earth. No other people has such small resources of food and shelter to sustain them. But they are sturdy and cheerful, these squat aborigines, with deep reserves of vigor and intelligence to keep them alive in the Arctic and to tide them over the changes of the future. The Eskimo tribes border the coast and the Arctic islands. Their life is bound up with the sea. Inland are the nine Indian tribes of the Northwest Territories, a changing, scattered people, less than 4,000 strong, whose nomad camps cluster around the banks of the Mackenzie and the white man's fur posts. Indian ways have altered. White man's food, clothing, engines and tools have come into use. But still the Indians live by hunting and fishing. And still they keep the old games and dances handed down through their mysterious history. Some think the Indians crossed from Asia long before the Christian era. In the Northwest language, the Athapascan. And this is related to the Tibetan and the Chinese. Today, as modern life reaches north, the Indians are a people in transition, losing the old ways, slowly learning the new. Cutting wide and deep through the lowland plain, the great Mackenzie River flows northwest to the Arctic Ocean. Along the river are a dozen tiny settlements, a hundred miles apart, ranging clear across the northwest to the Arctic coast. Resolution, Good Hope, Arctic Red River, a clavic. Steamers follow the Mackenzie Waterway 1,600 miles past three of the greatest lakes in the world, Athabasca, Great Slave, and Great Bear. Into the north, the church soon followed the pioneer explorers. After Samuel Hearn and Mackenzie came the missionary priest bringing the Christian faith into Indian country. Today in the northwest, the church is well established. Nearly all the natives in the territories are enrolled in either the Anglican or Roman Catholic faith. tried for generations by example to interest the Indians in raising crops and gardens. In their own mission gardens, they proved the worth of the northern soil, which raised good vegetable crops even beyond the Arctic Circle in a short but rapid growing season. But the Indians' life was hunting and trapping, and it kept them always on the move. Now, as in the past, they gather at the old fur posts with the pelts that white men want to buy.
skins of lynx, fox and beaver, muskrat and martin across the counter. Through the centuries, traders have gone after fur. And so long as they do, native trappers will range the northern lands and come into the post to bargain and trade. trip upstream to Railhead in northern Alberta. But with the oil well and the mineral claims, the story was the same. Too far north, too far from markets, too far for development. The well was capped, the cabins abandoned, fireweed and silence returned. swept down river. A new noise split the silence. The roar of aircraft down the Mackenzie, over Great Bear Lake, across the coast at Coppermine, and up to the Arctic Islands. To a land blocked in by winter and distance, separated by months of travel, planes flew up from Edmonton in 10 or 12 hours. A new chapter had begun in the north. Men came from outside to study the land and mine the rocks, bringing the north into the mainstream. Canadian life. Canada became first nation to map her territories from the air. From the northern lakes, the famous vedette flying boats took off on regular photographic survey flights. Royal Canadian Air Force pilots and observers flew over the empty lands and lakes, mapping unknown, unsurveyed country from the air. From aerial maps, geologists and mining men chose likely ground for mineral finds. In the early 30s, Flyers like Punch Dickens and Wap May outfitted their tiny planes for prospecting flights to the north. Toronto capital flowed toward the Arctic. The world soon heard of pioneer Canadian flyers and mining men. Hamill, McAlpin, Burwash, Brintnook, Byrne and Labine. Little Fairchild planes took off from the silent rivers, wheeled above the trading posts and headed further north. In 1932 was the rush year around Great Bear Lake. Three years later in the rocky terrain around Great Slave, flying prospectors took up the hunt for promising mineral formations. This was big time prospecting, with big investments in grub stakes and chartered planes. And when he landed on some unnamed northern lake, the prospector, pushing off in his light canoe, was the vanguard of big money, big industry, big interest moving north. Where he landed on the lonely shore, soon a raw new mining camp might rise. Shore of Great Bear Lake in 1930, Gilbert Labine saw promising outcrops beside the clear Green Lake water. Today, along the shore where he landed and prospected, stands the famous radium mine of El Dorado. Here, 40 miles south of the Arctic Circle, they mine the pitch blend ore that yields both uranium and radium. They 
mill the ore at El Dorado, sack the concentrates, and ship them 3,000 miles south to the refinery near Toronto on the Lake Ontario shore. The barges cross Great Bear Lake to the eastern end with oil for the mine and its diesel engines. The abandoned wells near Fort Norman took on new life, and soon a gleaming row of storage tanks lined the right bank of the Mackenzie, 300 miles west of El Dorado. Industry spread to the north. The clatter of tractors and winches sounded across the broad river. A new cracking tower unloaded at the wells meant that soon high-grade aviation gasoline would be refined on the spot every summer, ready to service northern plains. The Norman Wells became the oil depot for all the north, for the Mackenzie River traffic and the growing mines on Great Bear and Great Slave. New barges churned upstream along the Mackenzie to the Great Bear River, then headed eastward to the lake and the radium mine. Fifty miles up Great Bear, rapids and shallow water forced the barges into shore. At a sub-rapids camp, the fuel oil was pumped by pipeline over the ridge, around the shoals to open water. Oil flowing uphill in the pipeline. Gasoline in drums bouncing in a heavy-duty truck towards open water on Great Bear Lake, where the oil barges come at last to El Dorado. Southward 200 miles lies Great Slave Lake. Around the shore, gangs of men have come, trenching and sampling in the bleak rock and scrub timber. In 1935, rich ores, lignite, lead and zinc have been found, and most important, gold. Above the spruce forest rose the head frames of new mines, the Khan, Negus, Rikon, Ptarmigan, mining citadels in the wilderness. Now the mines roared with life as mills shook and crushed the ore and the great flotation vats and drums washed and floated free the gold. Twice monthly at the mines, pure gold, recovered from the ores, is poured into molds ready for shipment outside. Hard rock men from all over Canada Cobalt, Flimflon, Porcupine and Trail come off shift from the new workings. Meanwhile, fine gold crushed from the rocks of Yellowknife is cleaned and pickled for the mint at Ottawa. New men, new money, new energies released in an ancient silent country. the Indian and half-breed families of the North were swamped by the onrush of white men. Disease and hunger had struck hard. The old ways were done. The future was confused and dark. Over the wide sweep of northern tundra, muskox had vanished, and the migrating caribou were following new routes. Without wild game, Eskimos and Indians alike could not live. So in 1935, 3,000 reindeer were herded from Alaska into Canada to stock the coastal barrens east of the Mackenzie. This herd was to supply food and clothing for the Eskimos. For the Indians, the Dominion set up five great game preserves for caribou, where no white men could hunt or trap. Now a new beast made its appearance at a clavic on the Mackenzie Delta. Eskimos, who marveled no longer at an airplane or a radio set, studied with quiet awe the function and mechanics of the common cow. New buildings, hospitals and schools rose around the fur posts and river settlements year by year. The old church missions took on new importance, appointed now by Canada as regional hospitals for the natives.
new medical equipment and government doctors came to the north to stay, to give treatment and protection to the Indians in the fight against disease. The mission schools have a big job to do, to train the minds and bodies of native children, to teach them health and hygiene and useful sciences. Bright-eyed and cheerful, the children take quickly to new things and new methods. give them a chance to grow strong, active and self-reliant. These are the young natives of the North, new generation of a changing race. Every summer, government Indian agents travel from the settlements through the north to keep an important date with the tribes. Their arrival is the high watermark in excitement for the year. It means the payment of treaty, the annual fee provided by the treaties whereby the Indians surrendered their lands to the government of Canada. At Ray, on the north shore of Great Slave Lake, Yellowknife Indians gather to meet the doctor from Resolution, who comes to them as Indian agent with his party. A conference is held to consider their problems. They discuss hunting rights, game and forest fires, the arrivals and upheavals that industry is bringing to the country. The whole story of change, forced by natural laws on an ancient, primitive people. When this country was ours, the chief says, there was plenty of game for food and clothing. Now many of us are sick and others are often hungry. Yet the police tell us sometimes not to hunt certain animals in certain seasons. What do we do then if we see a moose in closed season and we are hungry? We don't want you to be hungry, the agent answers him. The game regulations are meant to keep the game for the Indians. If you must shoot an animal out of season to keep from starving, you should report it right away to the nearest mounted policeman and it'll be all right. But the payment of treaty is today what concerns the Indians. For the government has sworn that so long as the sun shall shine and the rivers shall run, treaty money shall be paid regularly each year. A feast for the tribe follows the conference. The fur company is host. For this is treaty day and the Indians will be paying off all their debts for the past year at the post. corn syrup, and tea. This is a good meal to the natives of a land where hunting is uncertain and there is often hunger. Nothing is wasted, and the hungry youngsters are kept busy cleaning out the pots. Now for the business of the day, the payment of treaty. Back at the agent's tent, the crisp new dollar bills are counted, parceled out, and passed across the table to the eager brown hands of the tribesmen. To 
each chief $25, to each headman $15, and to every other Indian of whatever age $5, to be paid only to heads of families for the members thereof. Now a game, a clamor of drums winding up the eventful summer day. They play an ancient game called Lasho. Two teams play. One side shuffles a marked stick from hand to hand. The other team must guess who holds the stick, despite the pounding of drums from the opposing side. The second team makes a guess, calls it, and the sticks are thrown in. Bets are won and lost. The sticks change sides, and the game goes on. In the old days, the primitive frenzy of the Lashell game ended in sky-high wages. Guns and canoes were won and lost. Today, the game is more restrained. Played in a canvas tent with white men looking on, and the stakes may be only matches. Above the tents and the sleepy shore, planes are flying to the gold fields, flown by cool headed bush pilots. Hello, YK. Have you anything for me? I'm going to come down on Desperation Lake. XQ over to YK. Radio stations at a dozen points throughout the Northwest keep contact with the pilots, sending out across the sky weather reports and instructions, relaying news from the settlements to the plane. I'm hearing you, XQ. Nothing new here. Say, you won't forget to call in at Harry's camp before you leave desperation. Yellow knife over to XQ. All okay here. Okay, yellow knife. Okay, finished. Eskimos watch the big freight and passenger planes slanting downward to the river at the Mackenzie Delta. Big shining Belankas and Norsemen taxi into shore. At a Klavik on the Delta, the Eskimos are thoroughly familiar with planes and air travel. From the flying boxcars, heavy freight comes ashore. Fifty cents a pound, Edmonton to Yellowknife. A dollar forty-two to a Klavik. Freight flying is a Canadian method devised to overcome space and time in the building of a new northern Canada. New planes taxi down Yellowknife Bay. New men come north, in for the day or the week, on a five-hour flight from Edmonton. And mail comes three times weekly now, not three times a year. Even sawn lumber has gone by air across Great Slave during the peak of the mining rush to Yellowknife Bay. Into the big Junkers freight plane, lumber for new cabins, stores and docks by plane and now by barge to the booming subarctic town of Yellowknife. Here is a mushroom city of a thousand people, built at top speed in four summers, settled already into a steady pattern of mining town life. A new cobalt, a new flintlock, a new Canadian mining town. The first newspaper, the Yellowknife Prospector, brought local, sub-Arctic, and world news to the new community. Here were Canadians setting up and doing business in the free open north, 
on the bare rock of the great Precambrian shield. The log schoolhouse at Yellowknife was more important than it looked. The first non-sectarian school in the Northwest, its one room soon grew to three. Youngsters from the mining families are the first generation of a big Canadian community to grow up in the true North, to know it as their home. They are the sign of Canada moving North into its own broad living room, laying real claim to the vast spaces on the map, linking them to the life of the Canadian nation. Yellowknife is 3,000 miles from Ottawa by rail and steamer, only a minute by telephone. A man can wireless to the world outside, or call by radio telephone to Vancouver, Toronto, or New York with equal ease. I want Ottawa, 28427. Mr. Porter. Thank you. One moment, please. Calgary, Ottawa, I will give you...